Yeah, are we on? Hi, everyone. Hello, thank you. We're gonna get underway in just a, just a minute here, so if you can kind of take your seats. Well, we were on time this morning, but we're a few minutes over, so I'll try not to take up too much time introducing everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon after lunch, and uh, hopefully you had a coffee and are ready for this fantastic lineup, I think, to discuss the future of cybersecurity. I am Jeff Stone. I'll be moderating this afternoon. I am the associate editor at cyberscoop.com, and uh, we really, again, have a fantastic lineup. Uh, next to me here is Chris Boyer, who is the Assistant Vice President of Global Public Policy at AT&T. Say hello, Chris. <laughs> uh, we have Norma Krayam. Norma is the Senior Policy Advisor and the Chair of the Global Cybersecurity Team at the law firm Holland & Knight. Who's next? We have Maura Bergen. Maura is the director of, subcommittee, of the Subcommittee on Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Protection for the House Committee on Homeland Security. So Maura is very busy. Uh, Megan Stiefel is also here. She is the Cybersecurity Policy Director at the nonprofit Public Interest Group, Public Knowledge, and Nathaniel Gleischer. Nathaniel is the head of Cybersecurity Policy at Facebook. I should say we also uh, were planning on having Evelyn Remily uh, from NTIA joined us this afternoon, but she had to drop out last minute. You can imagine that things are probably pretty hectic there. So, uh, again, thank you for joining us. There's a lot we have to discuss. We're gonna, we're gonna get into the NIST cybersecurity framework and some supply chain security issues, but I think we have to start, as I just alluded to, with the, the government shutdown. Um, so, Maura, I'd like to begin with you, not to put you in the hot seat, but can you give us your perspective on the shutdown and what its ripple effect could mean for U.S. cybersecurity policy in 2019? Um, sure. Is this okay? It's working. Um, so yes. So the uh, Chairman Thompson has spoken on this um, at length about his concerns about how the shutdown will affect uh, the national cybersecurity posture. At the outset, I think it's important to know that it couldn't have happened at a less opportune time. Um, we got HR 3359 enacted into law, operationalizing CISA um, in November, and six weeks later, half of its workforce is furloughed. So that meant that all of the activities that were being carried out for strategic planning weren't happening. Um, anything from pipelines to botnets to election security all shuttered. Um, it also meant that the organizational changes that needed to happen to maximize CISA's um, potential weren't happening either. Um, so all of those, all of those forward-looking activities were put on hold. Um, from a from another perspective, you, you, DHS set up the National Risk Management Center in July. Less than six months later, its activities were um, halted as part of the as part of the shutdown. And I think there's concern among our members about the cascading effects of the the lost time of strategic planning. You know, we heard yesterday that there is a three billion dollar cost to the shutdown, but really the cost is the month that we can't get back. Um, our adversaries weren't taking a break, but we were. Um, and that's, that's really unhelpful. And then just a quick point about employee um, recruitment and retention. It's not as if cyber experts that CISA is looking to hire have nowhere else to go. Um, they have plenty of places to go where they're definitely going to get a paycheck, whether or not they're coming to work. So um, I think in terms of recruitment and retention, questions about whether or not you're getting paid uh, are not helpful. We're going to get into uh, recruitment and retention in just a minute, but before we move on, Megan, I know you're at Public Knowledge now, but you spent some time at the Justice Department, and I wanted to ask you, you're getting back to work, right? From, from that perspective, what are some of these kind of cyber crime fighters, if you will, finding at their desk? Um. Is this working? So I think, you know, Morris' point are all good ones. The challenge, one of the challenges that we've seen over the past couple of weeks throughout the shutdown is the uh, cumulative effect that not being able to continue or begin investigations has had. So we're already playing catch up as it was before the shutdown. The challenge now, of course, is playing catch up to catch up. Um, not the sauce, but the <laughs> trying to keep up with the adversaries in cyberspace. Nathaniel, who was also at DOJ, can speak to what their challenges have been if he wants to. But, um, you know, there is from uh, digital investigations of electronic evidence are very complicated. 
They take time. Being able to investigate, for example, a hard drive or a server is not something that happens usually in a day. And from one investigative lead and the dump of a server, you can get tons of other potential leads. And just processing the, the uh, additional uh, procedural requirements to try to obtain additional evidence takes time. So you can imagine that if there was a, assuming that it wasn't uh, deemed emergency or de deemed um, essential, uh, some of these investigations are now more than six weeks delayed. Um, and so that obviously has a deleterious, deleterious effect on the nation's security. And I think the other point to highlight here is that our allies and partners rely on us for a lot of information and the ability to access um, communication service providers who are based in the United States. When we have uh, delays and shutdowns like we had, I think that sends very complicated messages to our uh, partners that we rely on immensely to secure the nation. So I, I guess it would probably depend on your position in the government, but you get back to work yesterday. What's your first priority? I mean, you just, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I mean, it depends really on where you are, I would say, but uh, part of it is an issue of, you know, how do you, this is, it's a team sport, right? So which of your teammates really needs you the most? Are you looking at the most critical of investigations that's ongoing? Is there uh, some policy response that's needed on something that's happened that may have been delayed due to other partners in the other agency not being available to come into work, for example, NIST or NTIA or parts of CISA, CISA, however we're saying it. Um, but it's certainly, depending on which part of the department you're in, you're also looking at sort of what's, what is the IC given to us while well, we haven't been able to come in and, and identify what's, what's most strategic of those threats to be able to tr begin or continue investigations? Uh, last week, before the shutdown ended, all five former DHS secretaries, including John Kelly, asked the White House to reopen the government, citing workforce retention as a major concern. I think Chris and Nathaniel, you guys are maybe well positioned to think about this as I'm wondering if there's any kind of innovative techniques that the government can use to recruit and retain some of these people who might uh, be tempted to leave, more tempted to leave. I mean, certainly from my perspective, the biggest way to retain people is that you're giving them the opportunity to work on serious, difficult issues where they feel like they can make a real impact. One of the lessons for us from the shutdown, actually one of the lessons for us certainly from the last year, uh, my team leads and coordinates the cross-company strategy to deal with cybersecurity threats, traditional hacking, phishing, et cetera, and also information operations, attempts to manipulate public debate. These are two different types of threats, but they're obviously linked in certain ways. And as we've really increased the scale and the scope of our focus on these problems, one of our big lessons has been the importance of collaboration with government. So our partners at DHS and our partners at FBI have been really important allies in working on this. And one of the consequences of a shutdown is not having those partners as ready and able to work with us. So that's certainly a perspective we see from the other side. You see the ripple effects when, I mean, Megan was mentioning this is a team sport. Having the whole team on the field is really important. Apologies for the early sports metaphor. <laughs> Yeah I, I, yeah, I think from, from my perspective, I mean, the, the shutdown itself, it was kind of like, almost like an element of like a hurry up and wait type of scenario because we had a lot of different projects we were working on with government, um, you know, whether it was the supply chain task force that DHS started or it was the National Risk Management Center. Um, and a lot of those efforts had just kicked off in November and December and then everybody kind of bailed because of the shutdown. So, uh, so there was a little, if anything, it's hard for me, I'm not in the government, so it's hard for me to assess what the ultimate impact of that's going to be, but um, there's an element of uh, lost momentum, I think, in some respects, that those things kind of all got put on hiatus for six weeks, eight weeks. And so now I think what we're going to have is everybody's going to come back, a lot of these initiatives are going to get reinvigorated, and there's going to be a rush to get things done quickly in order to meet deadlines. So I think there's, a, there's going to be a challenge here for industry in dealing with government because all those folks are not coming back and, and we're behind. And we have some things that um, we're committed to being done within time frames that are now, we've lost you know six weeks, seven weeks in the time frame. While we're discussing workforce, Nathaniel, I wanted to ask you, at the end of 2017, Facebook's general counsel told Congress the number of employees focused on safety and security would double to more than 20,000 by the end of 2018. M my first question is, has that happened? And, and if so, what are those employees working on? Sure, so um, it has happened. In fact, at this point, we have about 30,000 people across the company working on safety and security. 
So we've actually gone beyond that original goal. This is a large community of people working on a number of different things. Uh, a couple focuses. One, obviously, is our content moderation and review teams, the teams that are looking for content that violates our community standards. The other is the teams that I work very closely with, the teams that are looking for coordinated efforts to manipulate or corrupt public debate, what we call information operations. Those teams have grown extensively. And I would say the number, the growth is really important. But the other thing that's really happened internally is the closer coordination. We've pulled a lot of these teams together. We now have a central information operations disruptions team where we have investigators, policy experts, and product experts all working together so that we consistently can sort of detect these networks of bad behavior. We can remove them, but then we can also learn from that removal, identify some of the tactics or behaviors these actors are using, and make changes in the product to make those tactics and behaviors more difficult at scale. That kind of cycle is extremely important, and that's facilitated by the growth in people working on this. Go, moving up to 30,000 people is really important because this is a large problem, and it's not a problem you can solve just with artificial intelligence and technology. You need human expertise as well. These things have to work together. But bringing the humans together and bringing those teams together around a coordinated strategy has made a huge difference as well. While we're talking about Facebook, the New York Times had a fascinating story last week. Uh, they reported, uh, if everyone hasn't seen it, they said that Facebook is planning to integrate WhatsApp and Instagram and Facebook Messenger. Now, as part of that, Mark Zuckerberg said that uh, each of these services are going to have end-to-end -end encryption. I, I understand it's still early, but can you tell us a little bit more about Facebook's thinking on that and, and why it's a priority there? I mean, it is very early, so I can't say that much. What I can say is when we're thinking about the different messaging services people use, we're really focused on two priorities. How do we make it easier for people to communicate across the different services, and how do we make it safer and make those communications more secure? We're really just starting as we think through how to do that, so I can't go into that much more detail right now, but those priorities are really driving us. Again, I want to acknowledge that it's, it's very early, but, but right now, WhatsApp... Uh, unlike Instagram and Messenger, requires users to provide their phone number when they sign up and, and doesn't store any of their messages. Should we expect that to change? I mean, is that on the table yet? Like I said, we're really just starting to talk about this and what the best way to accomplish those goals is, so I don't have more that I can talk about right now. Okay. Forgive the uh, abrupt segue, but I want to quickly get into the NIST cybersecurity framework. It's been five years since the government issued this guidance on how agencies uh, can protect themselves, and it's spread to the private sector a little bit too, of course. Um, Norma, do you think the cybersecurity framework is, is still relevant five years in? So does, does this work? Yeah. Uh, I think the answer is absolutely yes. I mean, when the NIST cybersecurity framework was really created as a result of the 2013 cybersecurity executive order, it brought together in a collaborative way public-private partnerships with the government to come up with a structure that people can use to actually understand, analyze, and assess both their, what their risk is. And then for each company, whether you are big, uh, medium, or small, a structure that works in a flexible way for you. I think that NIST has done a great job and the private sector is engaged in a productive way to update the NIST framework in a way that still lives with, with the risk that we are seeing right now. Um, what we're also seeing too is there are a lot of other structures that are, that are working with this. And we've also seen other countries around the world adopt the NIST framework. And so whether it's the Ontario Electric Board in Canada for electric utilities or other countries around the world, I think that we in general between the government and the private sector have done a good job about seeding the value proposition of the framework uh, to other places. We have seen other regulatory structures sort of jump up to try and match and mirror. And um, we're certainly seeing in, uh, in some sectors as well, trying to come up with a better streamlined way to take what is the NIST framework and the current regulatory structure to make it more flexible. But I think it's a great document, and I think uh, we're still evangelizing that more companies need to use it, especially in the small and medium-sized companies. Please. We'll see if the mic's working here. No, I, I just offer my two cents. I, I think the NIST framework's been a big success story. And, and just, to, just a, a point of clarification, the, the framework in... in Nate can speak to this as well as I can. 
Uh, but the framework itself, when it was originally drafted, was really targeted for critical infrastructure. If you go back to 2013 in the Executive Order 13636, it was a critical, inf it was a framework for critical infrastructure security. And I think um, since that time, we've seen a lot of sectors um, in the critical infrastructure area adopt the framework. You know, I know for communications, uh, we did a CISRIC working group at the FCC where we took uh, the framework and we put out a 400-page report about how to apply the framework to the communications industry. Uh, that was completed around 2014. So um, there's been a lot of work done in the framework. Uh, so I think my overall view is it's been a big success story. And even internationally, we've seen the framework start to be used. Um, it's been introduced at ISO. It's, uh, there's an organization that, uh, in full disclosure, we're actually part of called the CR2 that's trying to promote the use of the framework around the world. So uh, there's a lot of efforts being done here to, uh, to advance it. So I, I personally feel like it's been a big success. You know, cyber is an ongoing battlefield, so it's, not, you know, it's never going to be completely done. But I do think the framework's been a big step in the right direction. Are critical infrastructure companies adopting the supply chain? element that was added last year? Or is it too soon? How does that work? Yeah, that's right. I, you know, let me say this. I think uh, Chris and I were saying the same thing at the same time. It depends on the sector that you live in. There are some sectors that are heavily regulated for supply chain already for your vendors and third parties. So I think taking that structure and trying to integrate it in in a sector specific way is something that's really important. Um, if you're in the energy sector, FERC and NERC right now are promulgating a rule about supply chain. So I think it does depend on um, what sector you're in and how it applies. But it's it's a very helpful document. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I think, I think in, at least in our industry, a lot of, uh, you know, we, we did another CISRC working group on supply chain security a couple of years ago. And so there's a, there, there are practices out there today very similar to what's in the framework. So I think they're being used. You know, the extent to which they're being used, that's always a an open question because I don't have any empirical data to show that one way or the other. But I, I, my personal view from being involved in a lot of these working groups is that there's a lot of momentum in the industry side to, to adopt some of those practices. One thing that I'd add, um, so I would, Megan and I both were actually at the NSC when we were finalizing yeah. the, the framework. And I think one of the reasons it's still so useful today is that it's not built to be a one size fits all system. It's built to be flexible. So many of these questions get to the fact that it can change and adapt as the space changes and adapts, which is the f sort of the truism of cybersecurity, the, the rate of change. And the fact that it's built that way has been incredibly useful because it lets organizations move into it, begin to use it, leverage it, grow up through it, and increase their security and have a framework to think about that and not feel like they have to do all or nothing. Right. And I, I understand there's a little bit of a, you know, supply chain, right? What I mean, it's, it could mean anything. I think it's a good way to think of it that I do at least is to think about understanding what kind of technology is in your business or uh, in your enter enterprise or environment. Um, Megan, can you tell us how public knowledge is, is helping consumers understand the kind of uh, technology they're working with? Sure. Um, so I think one of the um, issues that we've been grappling with is how do we uh, motivate and incentivize and drive change both at the consumer level and at the corporate level because consumers are consumers. They're not generally developing these products. They're the ones who are using them. So if a consumer is only offered an insecure product, their choice is not very great. So one of the ideas that we've been talking about over the past year is the idea of uh, thinking about cybersecurity as a sustainability management issue and moving from sort of the fear, uncertainty, and doubt to the notion that every stakeholder in the ecosystem has a role to play in making it better today for tomorrow. Um, the most recent uh, iteration of that policy proposal, if you will, is uh, we released early this morning a white paper proposing something like a security shield, which would be a consumer-facing IoT product label that would indicate to a consumer that a product has been developed and maintained and, and the life cycle will be more secure than its peer products. Of course, that and Chris, I'm sure, and others will jump in to say, well, that's great, but what are we? What what are the ground rules here? How do you demonstrate that there is? Right. What are the? What's the baseline? And um, we are a consumer advocacy group. We are not the standards experts, but the ultimate point that we make in the paper is that there ought to be, uh, we think, ideally, an interoperable, globally interoperable set of baseline capabilities. There may be differentiations based potentially on region or potentially sector specific, but that there certainly can be a minimum set of capabilities that 
products ought to have. Um, and I think obviously one effort that's underway to do that is through the NIST-based secu capability, security capabilities baseline process. There are efforts underway internationally, be it in the EU or in Canada. Um, the UK has uh, something like their security market, I think they're calling it. Um, but part of the point is we, we my uh, hope is that we are continue, we as the U.S., uh, whether we're a private sector, or public sector, or all the same team, are continuing to, to take a leadership role in this space globally, and that's where we think there, there is some utility to saying, just like the Energy Star was able to drive consumer and corporate uh, behavior and development in, the, in a positive direction, there's an opportunity here to try and make the same uh, proposition. Chris. <laughs> I, guess I, can, I can weigh in on that a little bit. Um, I actually think there's um, two buckets of issues around this topic. First off, totally agree that there needs to be better security for the IoT. Uh, I don't think that in anybody in the security world, I don't think that's much of a disputed point at this point. The real question is, how do we get there? And I think, and I think um, on the standard side, to me, there's no doubt that it would be beneficial to have some sort of baseline of security that could be built in to devices. I do think it needs to be a little uh, similar to uh, Nathaniel's comments about the framework. It needs to be a little um, variable depending upon the use case of the device. So, you know, if you're talking like a pure consumer play device versus like uh, some sort of device that's used like in uh, healthcare or even a device that's used in something even more extreme like in an uh, enterprise setting or, you know, like a nuclear power plant or something like that, there's going to be degrees or tiers of requirements. But I think there should be at least some level of baseline. And NIST is making progress on that. There's a lot of private sector, industry-led groups that are looking at that. Um, I do a lot of work at the Consumer Technology Association. Um, they put some stuff out. There's a group called the Council for Securing the Digital Economy that's put out some work in that area. So, um, so I think there's a lot of efforts going on around how do we do that, uh, come up with that baseline. And then there's a second order issue of once you kind of determine what the baseline is, how do you signal to people that you know, if you're if you're an ent entity like that, you're actually following the baseline, and that's kind of where the labeling issues come in. I think the labeling questions are a little more difficult in some respects because um, it's difficult to tell a consumer what exactly um, they are getting uh, in the security world because uh, you know a security. You know, given the world that we live in, you know, the, the it's only as good as it is the minute it was flashed with a piece of Face software. Time. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, like, the, so what exactly it means and how you signal that and how you create the right incentive structures. Uh, those are all. I think. I think. Um, uh, Megan's report does a good job of flushing out some of those issues and topics I think need further discussion, but I think there are two side efforts. You know, one is getting the baselines to develop. The other side is how do you promote and drive adoption of the baseline once it's once it's been developed. And I think those are both issues that do need additional work. Right. I mean, thinking about the idea of when you buy a device and there's this, some kind of a security rating on the side, potentially, right? I mean, is there incentive for companies to do that? Not yet, uh, I would argue. But part of our point is that, and it's not just ours, others uh, have said it before, we need to get to a point where we're not moving from first to market to secure to market. And so the question, and Chris and I have been talking about this even this morning, about what is the right incentive structure here? Um, in the past, we've, Chris is going to duck under the table probably when I say this, but we've talked in a little bit about, well, maybe not, um, the need also to re-examine the liability landscape. Um, is there, are there changes that could be made there? Is there, and associated with that, you know, what is the, does, is the FTC and are the expert agencies uh, fully equipped to um, secure and protect, not secure, but to protect consumers in the internet, in the era of internet of things? Um, but I think the the challenge, one of the challenges that I have in thinking about this is that because we are, there are so many of these efforts going on internationally and the U.S. has taken a voluntary approach to cybersecurity thus far, largely in sector-specific areas, there, there are obviously regulatory requirements, but if we continue along this path, but our, our uh, peer markets begin to, to require products to be labeled, what is a U.S. consumer to do in that space? Do they just by default, go for the potentially more expensive European one because the certification process made the product cost more? What if it's not as secure as it could be and the U.S. might have a different uh, basis upon which to, to judge security? Um, and I think, you know, one point, a couple of points that we highlight in the paper is that right now we're talking about consumer IoT products. And I appreciate the point that other products need to be, may need to be more secure in more risky sectors. I totally agree. But I do think that there is also a need to recognize that even 
consumer IoT products can have a significant impact on industrial control systems and other critical infrastructure. So the idea of, of again, sort of looking at the entire ecosystem and not looking at a particular, taking a stovepipe and siloed approach to say, well, I've conserved, you know, secured the consumer IoT space, so, you know, ICS is fine, or vice versa to say, oh, I'm an ICS, you know, entity. I don't need to worry about what's going on there with consumer IoT. Well, actually, no, you know, we don't, there are limits to the, to the analogy because all limits ultimately break down in cybersecurity, but there are, there are some real, I think, um, points that we can, can draw from in thinking about the ecosystem model and sustainability and the idea of, again, building products more secure today to enhance the ecosystem and secure that it, ensure that it's secure and information remains available. The integrity, uh, integrity of it has not been compromised and then it, where we want it to be confidential, it stays confidential in the future. Maybe just to add one piece, we as we've been working through this process, I think in the U.S. and in the EU, we have talked about a shared culture of responsibility, and I think we we have been moving in that direction that everybody needs to own their risk. It's not as if the most sophisticated player or sector should be the one that's responsible for that, and ultimately we do. Um, I, I make the joke when you talk to the 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 pure tech entrepreneurial sector who gets very excited about tech innovation, and I think that's fantastic. But we have to change the culture. Then when we talk about technological innovation, we are embedding a culture of security and privacy because ultimately we all live in a world where we see these risks every day. There's no reason that people can walk away and go, I just built the fastest widget, but I'm sorry it's not secure and I'm you know we have privacy issues. So I'm not saying that a culture change is going to make everything better, but I think if we talk about shared risk, we talk about what that innovative approach is, and, you know, hopefully there is a competitive marketplace. When an item is more secure and people see that, theoretically that the price will level itself out. Uh, but if you have certain players in the market who make the cheapest device that aren't secure and consumers don't know, then they may think that the cheaper product is okay. So I do think in this discussion sectors and companies have done a great job about coming together to talk about it. I, uh, I mean, Norma's opinion only, uh, as I like to say, we do want to harness what we're doing in the U.S. Uh, we don't, the Europeans are moving much faster on the IoT issue than we thought that they would. And I do think from a cultural perspective, we always think that the European model will take three, five, ten years. On the IoT side, it's not. Uh, and I do think we need to hurry up and, and find a way to come together in this. One other point there is that, you know, I've, I've always been of the view that um, something akin to the framework, the NIST framework for, um, for regular, would, for, you know, we've talked about previously, would be really beneficial for IoT, um, predominantly for the reasons that Norma raises. You know, uh, in Europe, ANISA, due to the European cyber law, is going to start a proceeding this year to develop its own set of standards for IoT and its own labeling as I understand it. So I think, I think um, you know, it would be helpful for the U.S. to kind of organize itself in a way where we could um, have something to put into that proceeding and talk about the way we're trying to deal with these issues. You know, NIST is doing a lot of great work, so I don't want this to be perceived as a criticism of what NIST is doing, but, um, but I, I still feel like um, something that's a higher profile effort uh, to organize the U.S., uh, both on the industry side and the government side, to have something to put into that process and talk about the ways that we think we can secure our IoT uh, would be very beneficial. I think one of the interesting points, particularly about the work that Megan and Pop Knowledge is doing, is one of the real challenges when we're thinking about consumer security is the ability of consumers to judge the security of products is particularly difficult. The nature of security is flexible enough and hard enough to assess, and the simple act of providing a labeling framework, the fact that it is so hard is linked to the fact that it is so important and useful, right? Because boiling it down to a way that consumers can assess is incredibly challenging. But if yeah. you can do that, it actually gives consumers a tool to be able to do some of the judging that is so difficult to do now, which is a signaling function that I think is hard to find in the broader conversation. And so just that simple act of framing a labeling model that is useful and works and helps people with different risk profiles understand what they should look for is an incredibly powerful thing. I'll just build on that just briefly. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the challenges that we have in terms of um, involving, having a full court press on ensuring the resiliency and um, stability of the internet landscape is that there are too many people who think that their role in cybersecurity, um, that they don't have one, right? There's plenty of 
um, people who own cars who aren't mechanics, uh, but that doesn't translate some, so well for people who use internet. They all think if I have to play a role in security, then I, I must be some kind of cybersecurity expert or some uh, computer scientist, and that's not the case. But if you give people a tool to have a role, labeling, then the rest of the, their responsibilities towards securing the internet, um, I think, become a little bit more accessible. So I think that's something to take into consideration, too. If I can just, um, one of the things that we talk about in the paper, which is not to say that we're endorsing it per se, is this idea of how do you make a, a sort of a smart label, so to speak, so that uh, the challenge, one of the, one of the challenges that we highlight in, in evolving a label, to Chris's point, is you know, a pre-market labeling snapshot in time is not, we don't think, not to get on a to keep beating the sustainability horse, but uh, is not sustainable, right? It's, it, a product may go out of life cycle, and if it, does, if it was not built with best practices that we recognize, which is to say that at the outset, the, its life cycle is determined and how long it will ma maintain uh, updatability and patching and some of the other work that NTIA has done over the past couple of years, um, then we're not making much of a difference. But if we're able to figure out how to, and this is a lot of ifs, educate the marketplace and educate, by that I mean uh, retailers and their sales folks, educate obviously the manufacturers, but also educate the consumer workplace, uh, marketplace to say, look for this label, work, somehow we are building in this educational uh, process by which consumers know, okay, I can, you know, at the back end there is some place where the current status of the product is, is known or, you know, then we have to get into how do you notify a consumer, we, we all have our, Different of our devices have, okay, you now need to download the latest iOS. Um, can we move to a model? How much of a model of that model do we want to have in the future Internet of Things? Do we want to have to be pushing patches to yeah. your smart refrigerator, which if I can avoid ever owning a smart refrigerator, I will um, at the, this point. Anyways, um, you know, we need to, we really need to rethink. Do you have a smart TV? Do you have a smart TV? Uh, because it's, it's hard to find dumb. one that's not, okay. It's pretty dumb, uh, intentionally. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, we, it's not, I don't think, part of Moyer's point is we, we can't put too much of a burden on consumers. We, we all recognize that. It's not a new thought. It's been around for a while. How can, what is that right mix between educating consumers to them taking ownership of what they have in their own ecosystem to it, that expanding beyond the home, uh, beyond the enterprise to the rest of the Yeah, I think, world. yeah, I mean, uh, my two cents would be, I think the question of, like, how do we develop, as I was saying earlier, like, the Getting the baseline together, I think there's, I'd like to think there's wide consensus that something that should be done. I think the issue of how you promote, how you indicate to a consumer to help them make an informed decision, whether it's a label, whether it's some other mechanism, what that right mechanism is and what the incentive structure around that is, I think is, a, is, a, is still an unclear question. Because labels, if you talk to different people that have been doing labels, like the Energy Star program, for example, has some specific incentives. You know, you save money, right? If you, don't, if you use an Energy Star efficient appliance, you arguably save money in your electric bill. So there's a clear incentive for the user and that indication to use that device. You know, security, it's not less, it's, it's not totally clear to me, you know, how that structure would, would play itself out. Out. I think it's definitely a topic that's worth additional conversation. I think on the industry side, we need to look at those different things and try to come up with, you know, what are the ways in which we we can make help consumers make an informed choice about buying the more secure version of a product versus the less secure version. Like to me, that's the question. And labels probably have some role there. There's also other ways you can promote that, but I think that's the discussion that needs to be had. I'd be interested, Megan. How do you see? Because I mean, there's certainly been work. So Mudge, mm -hmm. uh, I am the Cavalry. Right? Mm -hmm. There's a couple of different organizations yep. that have done some work testing, assessing IoT devices, and thinking about their exposure. How does this fit in with that? Is this leveraging some of that? Is it a, a, a different effort? How does those How do those fit together? I think it, in, in the they would leverage each other. They would be sort of mutually uh, reinforcing. Um, we haven't actually had a chance to talk to Mudge about that effort um, and CITL, but. Uh, this, certainly the idea here is not to reinvent the wheel. We need to draw on existing expertise and existing programs and look like Energy Star, but also look to where there are useful uh, attributes that can be brought into the cybersecurity conversation, leave some of the others behind. I think and I'm sort of looking this way at, at the question of incentives and, you know, part of the Energy Star process was, a, I think it was a tax rebate. So. You know, nobody wants to get into the tax bill again, but there, I really do, you know, is it a question of, now I'm going to put Chris on the spot, you know, if a consumer, you know, is there an opportunity here for manufacturer, device manufacturers, but also our um, electronic communication service providers to collaborate to, you know, if a consumer updates patches every month, give them five bucks off their bill. I don't know, I'm totally talking off the top of my head, but I do think that there's, 
we really, to Chris's point, need to get into a conversation about incentives because that's ultimately what it comes down to and making the incentives better for the consumer than they are for the bad guy. How do we expand this? Because what, what you're all discussing is, is valuable and, and IoT security certainly is a problem where I, I think we need leadership, but it resonates with me in terms of we hear a lot about like the need for a better information sharing and faster cooperation between the public and private sector. So, you know, do we need more leadership on this? I mean, how do we kind of push this idea forward, Maura? Uh, well, um, I, think there's, I think there's a role for various agencies across the federal government to play. I think that the leadership needs to come from the White House, and specifically someone who's coordinating the efforts around, among the interagencies. Good word. Right? Um, <laughs> And it's just not happening right now. And I think um, for a period of time, the, there was some legacy coordination happening because there was some infrastructure there. But I don't think that there's anybody who, who is incredibly leading the interagency efforts to address the vast array of, of, um, of activities to secure the cyber landscape. So there's no one. I, I don't think that there's enough happening there. And so you have this vacuum. Um, and you have DHS trying to step into it. Uh, in many ways, and it's kind of unclear what they're going to be able to actually do, um, and and what they say they can do, and what they're what they're funded to do. I think those are all different things. So I think there's a leadership vacuum on those issues. I'll just say this from a global policy perspective: we are starting to see, uh, for good or for bad, members of Congress looking to define what the Internet of Things is in statute to create task force and working groups and other things. So on one hand, I think it's good that we're starting to see a greater focus. On the other hand, I, I do think that there needs to be global coordination, at least within the US, on how this is going to play out. Because I think ultimately what we will see working with uh, companies across all sectors, if not, we will devolve into a sectoral approach that certain regulators will look at what IoT means in a specific sector and will start applying their regulatory approach to that or interpreting regulations to start telling companies what that means. Um, the piece that we need to figure out as well is that consumer side, so the smart everything, smart cities, smart homes, you know, where does that fit? And so I think ultimately either we come together, the royal we, to frame out what that means and to help people understand, again, roles and responsibilities, or we're going to see this patchwork coming through. Uh, we're worrying now about uh, different states passing cybersecurity laws by sector or overall. We're talking about privacy. Again, I don't think we need 50 different state laws on IoT and 50 different on blockchain. And So I, I think there does need to be something that comes together because otherwise companies are just not going to understand what the rules of the road are and we're going to have un, um, unequal enforcement depending on you know what, what product you're making and where it is. Yeah, I was just going to say on, on the standards piece alone, I'm going to throw out some acronyms here, but you have groups like MUDGE at the ITL, you've got UL, you've got CTIA who have all done work on kind of certification and testing programs. You, on the standards setting side, in addition to those groups, you've got groups like GSMA, um, you've got the CSDE, which is a basically a collaboration between um, um, the Consumer Technology Association, ITI, and US Telecom. Um, so, you know, there's a ton of different groups that are all working on pieces of this. At the government level, you've got ANISA and what's happening in the EU. You've got what NIST is doing. You've got uh, Japan looking at this issue. At the state level, you've got California who's passed an IoT law. Uh, so I could go on, but I'm sure I missed a few here and there. So, you, you know, the, so there's a lot of activity in the space. And so the, the reason earlier I was kind of seeing that I, I feel like we are at a similar tipping point to what we were in 2012 when the, the cyber framework came out where w when we started working on the framework for those of us who were like intimately involved in that process, um, there's a lot of standards that already exist. It's not like reinventing the wheel. A lot, of it, a lot of it was pulling from all the work that had already been done and organizing it in a way so that it could be done kind of cohesively across industry and, and across government. So I really do feel like, I think to feeding off Norma's point, that that's something that's necessary. Otherwise, we do run the risk of seeing kind of, spl of a splintering where we have a lot of different versions of IoT security. And I'm not sure that's really going to be good for anyone. I think all of us want to see better security. And so how do we organize those activities in a, in a productive way so that 
when you build a device, you kind of generally know, like, these are the basic baseline of things that I should put in the device to get good security, and, um, and how do we inform the consumer about that? Um, I think organizing that would be really helpful. And, and, and whether it's the U.S. government showing leadership in doing that, you know, through something like a framework-like process, which is what they did before, or whether industry does that, I think it's necessary. And so on the industry side, I can say that there's a lot of discussions, I think, with the public knowledge report and all the work that's going on with the CSD and other groups. You know, we're all looking at ways to kind of do that, um, you know, on the industry side, but certainly think doing that in partnership with government like we have in other cyber issues would be the desired approach. I want to go to audience questions in, in just a minute. So if you have something in mind, please get ready. But while we're on this topic, you just rang off a bunch of names. Does the government have enough information to provide to the private sector, whether it be threat intelligence or you name it, to incentivize cooperation? Maybe Nathaniel, if you have thoughts on that, you've kind of seen both sides of things. So it's a good question. I think it depends on when you say threat intelligence, what type of threat you're talking about, right? We're talking about cybersecurity a lot here. If we're also thinking about information operations, um, the exchange is a little different. But in both cases, from what I've seen, there is incredibly valuable information that government has, and only government has the capacity to assess. And there is information that only the private sector has and has the capacity to develop. I mean, the way I think about it now, we at Facebook have a particular platform and environment. We have the ability to dive deep and understand what's happening on that platform and environment. We ha do not have the ability outside of that platform and environment to do the kind of cross-cutting analysis that only the government can do. So if you think about a slice of the pie, if you think about the pie, there's a slice of it where we have deep information that is, quite frankly, more sophisticated in many cases than what the government can see about that slice. But then there's a broad, the rest of that pie, there's a lot of information we can't see. And I think that's one of the reasons why the partnerships with government have been so useful. It's interesting, I'm, I'm sure people saw this, but just, just before the midterms, we received a tip from law enforcement of a set of accounts that they believe might have been linked to malicious activity emanating from Russia. We were able to identify that, expand from that, and find broader operations and take very rapid action in a matter of hours. And that's a great example of identifying that information is based on the broader analysis the government can do. Understanding what's happening, broadening out, and finding the full scope of it is based on the deep work we can do. And so you really need the two together, and that's why the partnership is so important. With, and I should say, government's an important component, industry's an important component, the sort of expert community and the academic community is an important component, in particular the cybersecurity research community. Um, all of these different organizations look at different pieces of the puzzle, and I have found the most effective responses to um, persistent threats inevitably come when you see collaboration across those communities in every case. Yeah, I don't, I mean, just to pile on a little bit maybe, I don't know that the question is, is there enough information? The question not to, is, are the incentives right? Right, okay. And, you know, one could get into conversations about authority and liability, um, I would say, but, and I don't know if Nathaniel can speak to this now, but, I would argue that most of those two last things, the authority and the, the sort of incentives in terms of liability protection are far better than they used to be. Whether or not they actually needed to be set again, we can, that's long ago history and we've settled and we've moved on. But you know, the question is who's willing, I think, to, to, to roll the dice and say, yeah, we, we have this information, we think that it is in the net benefit of everyone to share it with the government or the government sharing it to the private sector. And I think we were, there are a lot of lessons to have been learned in the past four or so years in terms of how to, to leverage what uh, new and existing authorities and, and protections are available to really think more holistically about how to manage sort of new threats, including disinformation, but not just disinformation. Any questions? We have a few minutes. Uh, we have, um, just wait for the microphone. How about right in the... Hi, uh, Nathaniel Fruchter from MIT. Thank you to the whole panel. Um, I had a question about uh, sort of the labeling thing that came up and sort of the broader issue of cybersecurity education. Uh, and that is, uh, what do you think the balance of responsibility is between private industry and the government in terms of responsibility for educating the general public about cybersecurity? I know there have been some academics, at least, that have talked about sort of adopting a public health style model, which is an area where the government has taken the lead on communication and sort of coordinated and organized these sorts of public messaging things. And others have said that that's not such a good idea and it should be private industry taking the lead. So I'm curious about your thoughts on uh, those two things. Thank you. 
uh, I'll, I'm happy to talk about it. I, can, I mean, is it cliche to say that it should be a partnership? I was going to say the yeah. same thing. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I, I, I'm half, half joking, half serious, right? So, you know, um, I spent a lot of time over the years working with the National Cybersecurity Alliance, which runs the National Awareness Campaign in October, and that's really a public-private partnership, right? So they are partially funded through DHS uh, to run the Awareness Month, you know, in October, but they also get a lot of, uh, a lot of funding through private sector companies that partner with them. So... Um, I, I think that it's going to require both. You know, a lot of the companies have reach into their customer base and they're providing products and services. And so um, I think having a, I think the biggest thing is if we can try to figure out how to harmonize the message between the two, that would be, we have the most chance of making progress there, right? So you're, you're trying to get a consumer to understand some sort of message cutting through all the clutter that they're dealing with every single day from a massive volume of activity that's happening on the internet. And so how do you cut through that? You know, is a government message going to work? Is a private sector message going to work? You know, I think the more times you, you harmonize that message and, and kind of drive that home, the better chance you have a success. One concrete example we have of that, we do a lot of work to try to encourage people on our platforms to use things like two-factor authentication. Right. And we've had a few cases where we've been able to do that in partnership with government. So in the lead up to elections in Germany in 2017, um, we actually partnered with BSI, the German cybersecurity organization, to provide messaging to people with sort of Facebook logo and BSI saying two-factor authentication is a really important tool to protect your account. We really encourage you to use it and provide that coordinated message. Having that was really useful and it increased the people who responded to it. I think in general the reason the partnership is so important in the cybersecurity space is the velocity of change. Yep. The fact that these systems change so frequently it's really important to have the private sector that is developing the systems really have a sense of responsibility to be ensuring that people that they are developing secure systems and that people understand what that security is and what they should be doing. But you also need the government backstop. I think it's also a blend too. I mean, we it's easy to focus on things sort of once they've come to market, but we also have to, I think, take a step back even further to say why are insecure things coming to market? And it's not to pick on, you know, as Alan Friedman loves to say, like, nerd harder, and it's not to pick on the software developers. They're doing a great job with what they have, but we have to look back to, you know, a few year, up until, until a few years ago, you could graduate with a CS degree without ever having necessarily taken a security course. So we need to look back at what are the broader social issues that are driving some of these current market problems, and how can we take a more holistic approach to addressing them, including looking at you know, college educations and, and masters and PhD programs, but even sort of starting at the youngest and what's the appropriate curricula to start teaching it to, again, live in the modern interconnected era. Um, so I'd say it's, it, it's to Chris's, I don't think it, it, is a, it is, should be a partnership, but I think there's also different messages for different audiences. And so thinking about who the messenger is for the right audience and what that message should be is really critical. It, it, I'm just going to pick on that. I think it is important to, to help educate people because at the end of the day, there is a trust factor between consumers and whomever the, they're getting a product from. So if I have to explain to one more person that public Wi-Fi is not necessarily secure, <laughs> even though there's a disclaimer what, before you connect that says your information may be considered public, P consumers don't go one more step further intellectually to say, okay, that means someone can steal my data. So we also have to educate consumers that there's a balance between what is convenient and easy and is becoming really the norm. The norm for consumers now is you can connect to anything at any point at any time and do anything that you want. So making sure that they understand that there are trade-offs. If they're not going to accept multi-factor authentication and they want public Wi-Fi, then you know we're going to have to educate them on that piece. And really the other piece ultimately at the end of the day is if we're thinking about a smart city, as we've been saying, it should be smart and secure. And so that push and pull between what is a consumer's responsibility and I think the role of the private sector, I think that's evolving. But I do think people understand that there is, and Chris has said it, there's only so much we can help educate consumers to do. And at that point, they, they just simply aren't going to understand enough to know what actions to take. Uh, I, right here. Just right in the front corner. Thanks. Uh, so my first question is, broad for everyone. Um, the, uh, after the situation in Venezuela, there was a journalist who referred to, and uh, there were certain, um, Twitter was shut down, um, a number of social media companies. In the context of DHS, DHS work uh, identifying critical functions, is social media critical? 
Um, that's a fun one. And then um, the other question is for Mr. Glesher. Glesher, Glesher. Um, how are you dealing with third party security through the new integration center that you mentioned? And would you support security recs for third parties uh, in potential legislation uh, versus leaving those practices um, to be handled through contractual arrangements? So on the second one, I would say, I mean, when we think about, I think one of the core lessons of the last decade and a half in cybersecurity has been the recognition that uh, locations and sets of data or access points that people didn't think were exposed have ended up being vectors for threat. And certainly third parties that are how you connect and bring this information in is one of those key areas. We closely vet the third parties that we work with, both when we're thinking about hardware context and, of course, data context. That's why we're doing so much work in these days as we pull in and sort of tighten up APIs and, and providing access to that information. That kind of analysis is a core part of what we think about. You were asking specifically about legislation. Um, these are the kind of areas where I think having some guidance from government can be very useful. Um, we've said before that we are supportive of legislation in the cybersecurity space, in the information operations, in the privacy spaces. I think the challenge with all of it is making sure that it's collaboratively built so that it takes into account the way the environment is changing, right? The ways in which we would vet a third party today are actually very different from the ways in which best practices would have suggested you vet a third party two, three years ago, maybe even six months ago. And balancing that is really challenging. But I think we need to find a way to have consistent guidance and to also be able to continue to be flexible. And the NIST framework is a great example in this space because it's managed to provide some of that and be flexible over the course of many years of change in the environment. Oh, just really briefly. And, and in terms of um, Facebook being a critical function, I don't think we would go that far. But I do think that it plays um, an interesting, and, and I think all social media, for that matter, plays a unique role um, in terms of what the misuse of it can do to confidence in our institutions. And I think we need to be aware of that. And on that level, I think it's important to, um, I think we, over the past couple of years, we spent a lot of time talking about admiring this problem of, oh, there's all these different ways that social media can be misused um, by adversaries. Um, but we haven't really arrived at what our approach to addressing that is going to be. So are we going to figure out some Volunteer, are, is, are, are the social media organizations and all these um, and platforms going to come together and identify some voluntary actions that they're going to take to protect the data that their consumers share with them and their, their product users share with them? I think it's probably time to do that, but, and, and who's going to oversee that and what role is the government going to play in developing those standards and updating them as it's appropriate? I think those are conversations that I hope we have more robustly this Congress. Um, Sorry, I'm a little sick. Uh, so, I, and I think that's sort of what my boss is looking at right now. Yeah. I'm sorry, everyone. We, we could go all day, but we're actually a couple minutes over already. Um, so, um, unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, there's going to be more coffee downstairs. So, uh, and then at 345, I hope you'll...